Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the fifth Culture Circle. This is a, a bonus episode of the Culture Circle Conversations as part of the Access Ballymun and Dublin City Libraries project Belong Bien. Um, my name is Sarah Keen. I'm project coordinator with Access Ballymun, and I'm also the um, project manager of the Belong Bien project. Um, so I'm delighted that, that you're here to join us, that we're able to do this fifth episode. Today is technically the closing day of the Belong Bien project. So if this is the first time that you are joining us, never fear. The podcasts, the video content, the videos of the previous Culture Circle conversations are all online. You'll find the links on accessballymun.ie and the Dublin City Libraries website, which is dublincitylibrary.ie, dublincitylibraries.ie. Um, and that's where you'll find all of the information about the project. Um, but today we are here joined by um, Oshin McGann and Sarah, Sarah Maria Griffin. Um, I'm delighted that you're both here to give us some of your recommendations. As I said, this is the fifth in these conversations. So we've had librarians, authors, artists join us and give us uh, various recommendations of things to read and to watch in some cases. Um, and we're adding all of these to uh, a list that we've also compiled from the Dublin City Librarians. So there will be no shortage of things to, to keep us all occupied. Um, we're also joined by a, a feline friend there in the corner of Sarah's video, um, which is great. We're, we're a fan of the, the um, uh, pets joining us on these Zooms, so great to see. Um, Oshin, I might come to you first for your recommendations and you might give us a little introduction to who you are. Okay, um, my name is Oshie McGann. I'm a writer and illustrator. Um, I've been a commercial artist for most of my life, basically drawing and painting for money. And I've been a published author since 2003. Uh, I've published about 43 books and a bunch of short stories. Um, and I write for different age groups. So basically anybody, any, whatever age you are, I wanna have a book waiting for you. Um, and um, the latest one is Short Hopeful Guide to Climate Change, which I would have talked about in one of our earlier talks. Um, kind of a light approach to the subject, hopefully not doom, too doom laden. And the idea being kind of to engage some, you know, some interest and, and um, some entertainment out of it is, you know, it's just so it's not kind of loaded with a kind of textbook like facts. Um, but I, I write a lot of different types of stuff. I tend to write whatever I'm interested in at the time. And um, that one came up, so that was my first non-fiction book. But um, apart from that, novels, picture books, um, chapter books, whatever. Um, so um, in terms of what I was going to recommend, there's, there's actually more two writers than, than it is two, two mm -hmm. books. So the first one is Frances Harding. I'd, I'd recommend anything by Frances Harding. Um, I think she's amazing. I really relate to her very weird imagination. Um, I'll, I'll list a few just so you kind of get it. My favorite is Deep Life, which is set in this kind of um, seafaring world. There's a whole bunch of an archipelago of islands and the civilization lives off the remains of dead gods like them. There are loads of different shaped gods and they're, they're only, only the remains are there. And any kind of material that from the gods' bodies has powers of different types. Um, and there's basically a whole conspiracy between pirates and the people in power over, you know, what's happening with and how these materials are being used to make, uh, in one case, for instance, a submarine. So um, it's brilliant. It's, it's full of detail and full of kind of um, color and really weird little kind of machinations. And I, I love the kind of, it's of hers, it's probably my favorite one. Um, there's another one called Cuckoo Song, which is quite a different one, quite dark, spooky mystery story where a girl is, steadily starting to realize that she's not who she thought she was. Um, and that actually there's a whole, there's a point in her life that for some reason um, feels completely different to everything that came before and nobody treats her properly. She, she feels like, she, you know, she doesn't know who she is. Um, I don't want to give away because the actual, the whole premise of the story is in the, uh, her identity. Um, no spoilers and, here, yeah. Yeah, it gradually yeah. starts to dawn on her, hang on a second, everything is wrong. Um, so, and then there's Fly By Night, which was her first one, which I read a long time ago. I did an event with her in England, got a camera, went 10, 10 years ago at least. Um, and that's kind of a, um, it's a very whimsical fancy story. And she's very lyrical, very imaginative. And also, um, that one was very funny. Not all of her books are that funny, actually. Um, she can change tone. Um, and there's another one called Gulster Island, where um, there are these characters where they can release their senses, their senses can go off to other places. And, and this is kind of almost like a religion on this island. 
and then something happens as a disaster happens that affects all the people who can do this okay. um so she's got brilliant imagination really buzzing you know weird imagination that i really love um the other writer is elizabeth ween and I read one of her books, Codename Verity, years ago now. I was, I was judging a competition, a writing competition. And she sold as YA, but I think it, yeah, as easily kind of adult books. Um, it's, they're very complex. They're very intricately plotted. Um, she's a pilot. So that comes across in, in this first book because it's between a pilot and a spy in the Second World War. And they crash and the spy is taken into a prison camp and the, the pilot's trying to find a binder and get her out. Um, and then there was another one, Rose Under Fire, which again is much more set in a prison camp. And then there's a third one, which I'm just waiting to read. My my 13 year old has it at the moment, um, called um, was it the Enigma Game? So I'm kind of waiting to get my hands on that one now. So that's why she's in my head at the moment. Um, and really, again, complex, um, excellent character um, description, and um, you know, doesn't talk down to a reader. Expects the reader to be yes. able to follow this, and I, I really like that about her books. Um, so there's another one I just mentioned offhand, which is for younger kids, and that's Andy Griffith and Terry, Terry Denton's 13 Story Treehouse. There's 10 of those books in the series. They're for a younger group. My, my younger daughter's loving those at the moment. And I'm not even going to try and describe plots. They're bonkers. But each section, like each book, the treehouse gets 13 stories added to it. And it's yeah. just mad. So yeah. uh, if you've got a kid who likes David Williams or Roald Dahl or any kind of madcap, you know, um, uh mr gum books anything like that these the these are ones for those Great. so that's the 13 story tree has and then all the sequels it must be an interesting experience in your house to have um books being passed from child to parent and parent to child um but it also strikes me as somebody who writes for all ages that you must read voraciously across all the age groups yeah, I mean, it's, I probably did it more than, I, I probably don't read as much as I used to. Um, mm -hmm. I read so much for work and then I kind of, when I sit down, I kind of, I want to read something different. Um, and also what I'm reading tends to be steered by what I'm writing. So at the mm -hmm. moment I'm reading a lot of, I'm reading, I'm writing a historical novel. So I'm right, I'm reading books from that time, fiction of and course, non-fiction. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually reading The Riddle of the Sands, which is Erskine Childers' spy book um, from 1905, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh so, but yeah, I mean, I, I will, I'll pick up any book if it's the right thing for me to read at that time. Um, and I love looking at good illustrations. I don't, I don't get to read enough comics, for instance. I love mm -hmm. looking at illustrations. Um, and that whole, the melding of the illustration and writing together was something I've kind of really very much brought up with. So um, even in novels, I like to see illustrations. So I know mm -hmm. not everybody does. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for those. And just you mentioned our previous series of, of chats there, which is you, you've been on one of these lunchtime conversations with us in Access before. So just to give that a little plug, I know Kate will pop the link in the in the, the Facebook chat, but that was the Cup on Tay series of conversations um, with our green arts department. So if people are interested in the environment and have a an interest, I suppose, or a, an increasing awareness in the climate crisis that's facing us, you can go and, and there's some really, really good conversations on our YouTube there that you'll find and you'll see Oshin talking about his book there too. Um, Sarah, he, we've, we've lost our feline friend, but no matter, we'll Busy. focus on the books. Yeah. <laughs> Got things well, to do. If you could give us maybe a little introduction to who you are and what you do and then your recommendations, please. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, my name is Sarah Marie Griffin. I'm a novelist and writer and scene maker. Um, my um, first two novels are called Sparing Van Parts and Other Words for Smoke, um, and they are available in all good bookshops. Um, I, since the beginning of the pandemic and a little bit before, have been running a postal service uh, where I send zines in envelopes to people in their homes um, through Patreon. Uh, I started running it like a series of um, pandemic dispatches. So for example, my first one was sent out seven days after the first lockdown was announced. My most recent one was 654 days in. So, um, you know, it's that kind yeah. of, or 500, you know, like there's a, a rolling, um, I guess, personal newsletter throughout the pandemic that I've been sending to people's homes. And it was just funded by the Arts Council this autumn. Uh, by the project awards to continue on with Great. different venues across Ireland this year which is really exciting so I work on long projects and very short ephemeral projects as well um, my next novel is uh, next two novels are currently in the, in the great big novel mill so while 
there humming along quietly invisibly I've got um the zines to keep me going so great and can just maybe for people who aren't aware of what a zine is can you explain that to us please uh a zine is a handmade hand folded hand stapled pamphlet uh made in a short run production so maximum about 200 copies um they originated um or kind of came to prominence, I guess, during the punk movement and during Riot Girl, where there were means of people circulating their own stories and political discourse through uh, handing out free pamphlets or cool. pamphlets yeah. for a dollar, or they'd leave them in record stores. There was a kind of a culture of them here in Dublin when I was growing up. And I uh, got really into collecting them as a teenager. And when I lived in California, I started making them over there. And mm. in the last couple of years, they've resurfaced and become a really important part of my practice. Great. Um, yeah. It's cool. So you might um, share that link with us then if people want to join the, the, this process. It's through Patreon, but we'll, yeah, we'll pop the link in the chat. patreon.com forward yeah. slash zine club. I don't know how great. I got that URL, but it's deadly simple. <laughs> well, it's that's a great one. one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so what have you got for us uh, as recommendations then, Sarah? So I'm a bit of a patchy reader as well myself. I found the pandemic very, very difficult on my reading, which is crushing given that in order to write well, you kind of have to read widely and consistently. And uh, clawing my way back to being able to read a novel without dropping out of the magic really easily it was quite tough so the books that kept me hopeful and inspired and excited during this time are ones that I think I'll probably treasure forever um mm. I'm going to give similarly to a scene give a couple of authorial recommendations people whose work I love um I'm probably going to start out with the biggest most sweeping recommendation which feels like you know the Kind of enthusiasm of the recently converted i'm going through an enormous Maeve Vinci period at the moment um and i just finished um i only read her for the first time in 2019 uh so very very late to the party mm -hmm. uh but from there i have myself and two of my friends separately we listen to the audiobooks and we read the books together in a sort of an informal book club. Kate Binchy is the narrator of the audiobooks, which should be available on Box if you're a person who uses the library services. I get them for, I get them with my with my tokens on Audible. Um, and uh, I've read obviously Circle of Friends, Echoes, Evening Classes, and uh, more recently um, I read Light a Penny Candle, and mm -hmm. I'm doing some work with. Um, I will get to talk about that in a very public capacity soon. Light of Great. It's important. Yeah. I got to do something very cool to do with Maeve's um, legacy recently. And um, Light of Penny Candle is phenomenal. And it was her first novel, which is mm -hmm. sort of mind bending. It has, it's so gorgeous and effortless and accomplished. And so many of the themes that she explores in her later work, like motherhood mm -hmm. and friendship and mismatched motherhood and the difference between the Irish and the Irish abroad big families small families the queries that she uh, weirdly enough evening classes she loves evening classes she loves people doing courses um, so some of the things that she explores um in her later novels are planted here in Light a Penny Candle mm. uh, it deals with some really tricky subject matter as well it's set during um World War II and concerns a girl who was left um by her parents sent by her parents to her mother's childhood friend in Ireland to spend what turns out to be three years <laughs> with an Irish family um, and then get sent back. And it's about the two girls uh, who were children in the war growing up together and having a correspondence. So it's sort mm. of an epistolatory novel in some ways. Um, she's just phenomenal. And I think she changed my working life. She changed the sort of thing that I aspire for as a writer. She uh continually blows my mind and mercifully I'm very new to her which means I have a whole body of her work that I get to learn from and explore and go on these journeys with and I'm especially because I'm reading them with other people mm. um so that we have these our text conversations are peppered with references to the books because we're on these journeys together so I would not only say if you haven't read her seek out circle of friends that's the banger that's the one that will bring you into her world 100% uh, but also maybe find someone to go on that journey with. She's really mm. wonderful about relationships. So I am. Um, 
you know I I came across now I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head so I will find it and we'll put it into the into the chat for people but there is a book um of her letters that yes. was a published um I think by by her family um posthumously and it's I I remember reading it so vividly because the power the emotion in it and the strength of the letters and also the the care and attention and the love that was put into creating this piece by her family um and also how like they're hilarious she was a really so funny, funny so writer funny. you know so they're actually a very good one for from a lockdown pandemic reopening perspective and you know as we have heard often that she was the kind of writer who'd get her inspiration from overhearing conversations on the street oh my god the thing one of the things that I think maybe we've all missed over the past two years is like the eavesdropping and the the casual nosiness of walking down the street or sitting on the bus I feel like the stories about the kind of person and individual she was are also very inspiring. You don't meet anybody who has a single critical word to say about her. She seemed to have been very compassionate and very engaged mm. with everybody that she met and also a notorious eavesdropper. And I've always been that way myself. So I feel as though her doing it gives me permission to walk yeah, around with my 100%. headphones off just listening. I was just in London last week um, and uh, while, while frightened out of my mind on the tube, you know, like a country mouse, I... Um, listening to people talk was just gorgeous I could have sat there all day catching coronavirus and listening to them you know <laughs> um amazing conversations so yeah she's in a real um has a real humanitarian edge to her work her work is very I think that she gets pinched uh, pink washed socially a lot mm. as sort of like women's fiction and I completely don't agree with that at all I think that her work is very um humanitarian and it looks very closely at the human condition and just because the human condition happens to take place in a kitchen doesn't make it any mm. less human and um, so her her feminism and her politics are not overt they are more practical and uh I am obsessed with her <laughs> so I, I'm, going, I'm going through a big finchy phase at the moment Great. and I'm, I'm yeah. finding it very affirming the other books that I read this summer um this summer she says in January time stake <laughs> <laughs> oh time is it's kind of snowing outside my window um it's still march 2020 yeah 100 i don't think i don't think any of us have managed to move too much further than that not anyone tells you they're doing okay is lying <laughs> you know <laughs> like it's, it's a strange time but uh last summer when i i went i finally was able to sink back into this kind of very heady few weeks of reading again in a way that felt durational um I got into the work of Paul Tremblay, which is really, really different to Mae Vinci. Mm -hmm. Paul Tremblay is a modern horror writer. He mm -hmm. has uh, the book that got me, re I read this book and then I read three of his other books in a week. I was just like completely switched on, like I hadn't felt that um, excited about storytelling and that inspired like literally inspired people throw around the word inspiration and inspired a lot but it doesn't actually happen to you very often as opposed to reading Paul Tremblay for the first time and feeling like a really serious renewed sense of purpose and an understanding like if, it's very easy to get jaded and burnt out and quite numb because we're kind of under a continual barrage of sort of information from the internet and stuff and um reading Paul Tremblay gave me a very very strong sense of oh this is why <laughs> this is why people write books this is why people read books um but very very different thematically and tonally from Vinci's work uh his big successful book which was sort of plucked from the horror landscape by Stephen King and championed like you I, as you can imagine you got to be fairly serious business for Stephen King to be like this girl's living daylight say to me um is head full of ghosts which is a possession story kind of it's told from the perspective of an eight-year-old girl whose 15-year-old sister has become possessed. And uh, it's an adult novel, very adult, uh, head, heads up, um, every content warning under the sun. And it's she's an adult in the beginning of the novel and she's meeting a journalist to tell the story of this thing that happened to her as a child. And the rest of the novel is from her perspective as an eight-year-old and for her, from her perspective as her older sister becomes different and, and strange. And her parents not only recruit a local priest to perform an exorcism on her, but also get involved with a reality TV company who want to film her exorcism. So it's from the perspective of this eight-year-old whose home is being invaded by all these camera people and this priest, while her sister becomes something completely different. And it's some of the most elegant smoke and mirrors work 
in terms of mystery, suspense, unreliable narration. You have no idea if this child is possessed or if the teenager is possessed or not. You have no idea who to trust. The character work is astonishing. It's really one of the best books I've ever read. And it scared the living daylights out of me. It's Which I think is an, a, an important uh, uh, warning for maybe those of us who wouldn't be quite as um, brave or ready for, yeah, for a it's, scary read. It takes a lot of courage, but it's. I think the protagonist is such a wonderful whole character that you want to go on this voyage with her. Mm. And I would say that there are, there are frightening moments in it and there is um, a lot of like bodily stuff in it. But by the same token, the mystery is a really elegant machine Great. and the way the mystery unfolds is just so so gorgeous um he has a collection of short stories called growing things which mm-hmm. is sort of thematically connected a bit to you can see the origins of head full of ghosts i love that when you find that with an author where you can like i said with made you can see all the seeds in light a penny candle for her future work in growing things you can see the seeds for head full of ghosts uh, so I immediately went back and read Growing Things. And then he has another one called The Cabin at the End of the World, which is the single most tense book I've ever read in my life. It's about a couple and their daughter who go off to a cabin by the lake and four strangers show up at the door and want to come inside. That's all I'm going to tell you. I think uh, cabins by lakes seem to be a perfect space for a mystery. Oh, wow. Wow. It said over three days and you feel that time passing. You feel every minute. And his... If you're inter- I don't know if anybody's interested in reading the pandemics, but he has a book that he wrote during the pandemic, which is called Survivor Song, which is set over three hours. And okay. it's about a, uh, I, I, when you're talking about speculative fiction and horror, it's very easy to say things like zombie apocalypse and people go, oh yeah, okay, whatever. Zombies, yeah, cool, great. And then you completely undercut the power of the story by attaching mm-hmm. buzzwords to it. It is about a situation in which there is a virus that is turning people into people who eat other people. Mm -hmm. And um, it begins with a woman who is pregnant, super pregnant. And uh, she's hanging out with her husband at home and they've been indoors for a while and they're being very careful, familiar. And somebody gets into the house and kills her husband uh, immediately, page two or three. And then she has to, she gets bitten and has to go and get to a hospital and gets in touch with her teenage roommate or college roommate who's a doctor to help her get to a hospital and everything that happens in the novel happens between her leaving the house in this bitten state and getting to the hospital unbelievable breakneck definitely and, uh, some recommendations there for people not for the faint-hearted might be our uh, warning on those ones yeah i want to i've i've two suggestions here that i want to bring up one because it's very like very tenuously related to um Oshin's work and that is via the nature via the kind of the natural world so this is an irish nature year it's a really beautiful book there's a page there's a an entry per day uh, of the year and it's everything from I think I was checking it earlier on today for the 7th of February it's a, a short entry about jackdaws but there might be an entry about snowdrops or about uh, wild garlic or whatever it happens to be for the date so it's a really nice one to drop in and out of um, without requiring too much knowledge or too much attention um, and you can learn something small and it helps you kind of maybe look around at the world around you without a uh, you know when you're when you're out and about um it's a really nice one and then um the other book I want to recommend is Sarah Winman um kind this is kind of an an author recommendation as well but uh Sarah Winman still life along the lines of Maeve Maeve Binchy in that sense of empathy and uh compassion for the characters this particular book is set largely in Italy and when I was reading it last summer when we weren't going anywhere and I felt like I had landed in Tuscany mm. so um, it really does pull you into a, a new space but she has some really beautiful writing um, and some some of her other works. Um, a Year of Marvelous Ways is a really interesting one which has you know slight kind of hints of fantasy and hints of uh kind of magic in it but is also um it's really it'll pull you in you're never entirely sure what's going on but it's a really beautifully written uh piece of work so they're they're my two suggestions for today um 
I want to say thank you to both Oshin and Sarah, uh, uh, Oshin and Sarah and Maria Griffin for, for the recommendations, for joining me. Um, some really interesting ones there. I always love hearing from writers, I suppose from, from makers, what it is that they engage with as makers and also as audience members. So um, thank you both for those suggestions uh, for people of all ages, for the 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 faint of heart and the braver. Um, so thank you for that. As I said, the project is wrapping today, the Belong BM project. So I want to thank all of the people who have engaged in these culture circle chats over the past uh, five conversations. Um, it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to hear from everybody and to, to add to my ever increasing list of things to read. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, and as I said, if you're interested in the Belong BM project, you'll find all the information on accessballymun.ie and the Dublin City Libraries.ie websites. So thank you very much. Thank you.